Uh, tonight's speaker, I'm very fortunate, is Deborah Harold. Deborah is a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science and is also in the Liberal and Professional Studies Department at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from uh, the University of Chicago, and she's published on a variety of subjects, including such topics as women's space after the Arab Spring, uh, the Al Algerian economic uh, discourse, the menace and appeal of uh, the informal economy of Algeria, as well as others. And so please join me in, uh, in welcoming uh, Deborah Harold to Chemnick County College. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, for coming tonight, okay? Um, for a while, Algeria's been really boring. Unlike uh, most of the other Middle Eastern countries, Arabic-speaking countries, with the Arab uprisings or the Arab Spring, real, real things happened, even if they were bad things, right? Um, Syria and Libya have gone through very difficult times. Egypt turned into a very bad trajectory. Tunisia doing pretty well. Algeria didn't really do very much during that time period. It seemed frozen. Uh, but since earlier this year, there have been massive demonstrations every Friday. So it's called the Harak, which just means the movement. So Friday's the Muslim day of worship. So whether or not you go to the mosque, and many people don't, I would say most people don't, uh, Friday is Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon. And in Islamic history, it's the time when people would hit the streets after a rousing sermon and the ruler needed to know how you felt about it. So it's an interesting time for a massive demonstration, but certainly everyone's off work Friday afternoon. So these have been going on for about eight months, week after week after week. And they were completely unexpected. There, was, seemed, to, there seemed to be nothing to start them off, but we'll talk about the events behind them. Um, these are well-organized events. They're very peaceful. They include Algerians of all ages and from different political commitments. We see secularists, socialists, Islamists, and people involved in Berber politics. We see people of different socioeconomic classes. So this young man, woman, um, by her use of English and English idiom, um, she's educated, okay? With that headscarf, she's telling us she's pretty serious about Islamic commitments. I'd say upper middle class, okay? So we've seen people from very different backgrounds in these, in these demonstrations. So the military regime has responded by arresting some opposition figures. They detained a member of the French parliament and important business figures all with spurious accusations that they were conspiring against the authority of the government or working against the unity of the country or other kind of made up non things. The military regime has agreed to new presidential elections in, no, in December, but the demonstrators have not been satisfied with this. Algeria has lots of elections, all of them pointless, they would say. What demonstrators want is a new system an end to this kind of military regime, military regime plus crony capitalism that has governed Algeria for decades. So one of the tough things that, um, it's good that none of you are teachers, um, because teachers always are, want students to come up with what type of government do we have here? So students look on Wikipedia and they'll say a parliamentary elected system with, um, you know, three branches of government, executive, parliament, and the judiciary, blah, 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 uh, regular elections. But it's the military behind it or on top of it. One of my colleagues calls this ruling but not governing, in which the military doesn't do the micro stuff. They just kind of sit there and watch everybody else run it and intervene when they don't like the way things are going. But it means that the Minister for the Economy, Minister of Finance, Minister of Defense, all these people holding these portfolios, um, they have their orders, they know what they're supposed to do, and if they go in a different direction, they'll be removed. So 
I don't know what you call a government like that. It's, um, it has the parts of a parliament, or the parts of an open political system, but not much of the substance. It also has periodic liberalizations. So um, when political scientists say liberalization, they usually mean two things. They mean either an opening in terms of politics. So um, I see all these grown-ups over here, not that you're not grown-ups. You remember the opening of the Soviet Union with um, the economic opening and the political opening all at the same time. So both of those are liberalizations. So periodically, Algeria has a, an economic opening or claims that the uh, old socialist or command economy is going to be more open. And managers who are running public sector firms say, great, you know, I can now make better decisions about this firm. And they start firing people who are um, married to um, the prime minister's daughter or getting rid of people who have not been useful. They start trying to source what they need competitively. And the next thing you know, they've been removed. So the economic liberalization of Algeria has been very uneven. And the political liberalization, uneven as well. But historically, since you asked about Tunisia, there's much more freedom of speech in Algeria than there has been in the past in Morocco, Tunisia, or Egypt. Tunisia now is the exception, right? Totally free press. Um, but Algeria has had lots of newspapers. Um, newspapers seem kind of old-fashioned, but if you're going to watch satellite television, you're going to watch French television, they're going to be telling you about the weather in Paris, and you're not going to know what's going on in Algeria. So newspapers remain really important. And there are, um, there's one super independent newspaper, and as the editor explained to me, we are the independent newspaper because we own our own presses. Um, in the past, there are lots of newspapers, and there still are, but if the government has, um, has a down on what you wrote last week or yesterday, they'll decide that your accounts aren't quite right or that there's a paper shortage and they aren't going to run your newspapers. So these ways that um, freedom of the press is restricted, constrained, and interrupted. So this, this kind of hard to describe regi regime, a military that rules, uh, that doesn't govern, that intervenes constantly. Um, so what the demonstrators want is not just new elections, but a new system. And what they want, basically, is accountable government. So democracy is a wonderful hurrah word, but let's start with a government that's accountable. They want a government where elections are held um, and the, the elections are meaningful. They want opposition parties to gain votes and ministries. Um, they don't want everything to be decided. So on the one hand, corruption seems to be chronic and continuous, and on the other hand, opposition figures are always being accused of being corrupt and their funds tied up so that they can't act. So it, accusations of corruption are used to seize assets, remove people from politics, and just to spread the dirt around, right? Once you've been accused of corruption three times, um, people just don't feel as comfortable about it. So these don't seem unreasonable demands, right? They're not radical, they're not shocking. So what has been unreasonable and completely out of touch with the Algerian public is this military ruling group. So for the past decade, they've been ruling through a figurehead president, um, Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Let me get you some pictures. Um, I've lost track of this for a second, let's see. Military government, um, I'll leave these dates up for you, Bouteflika. Okay, stroke in 1993, and downhill ever since. Okay, I'll leave that up if you want to contextualize. So Bouteflika was an approved military candidate in 1999 uh, when the country was coming out of a civil war. He seemed a reasonable figure. So there's this civil war going on, there's this traumatizing assassination of another um, revolutionary war figure. 
he seemed like a reasonable candidate to support uh, for a period of stability. Civil war, you want stability, right? I've mentioned that uh, Algeria has uneven economic policies. At the time when Bouteflika was being uh, appointed, oil prices were very low. So, as it says in the title, Algeria is a petrostate. Most of its revenue comes from oil and gas. Um, 60 to 80 percent of the income of the nation, and it goes right to the government and is dispersed and allocated that way. So uh, oil prices, energy prices going up and down makes a big difference for spending. And energy prices always go up and down because when energy is expensive, more sources are developed and then that's brought on stream and then the prices come down continuously. But the expense that was put into bringing the stuff on stream, those investments are there. So you have too much oil. So Oil gluts or energy gluts are something that's just part of the industry, but it wrecks havoc with, con with country budgets. Although this phenomenon has been studied for decades, but it's very hard for countries to cut back on their spending when the, the prices go down and their budgets are in a bad situation. They tend to borrow. So in a very short period of time, prices are down, and they have debt. So Algeria has been in this bind several times. Did I say not accountable government, right? So the other problem was after the Civil War, again, it's hard to overestimate the importance of stability and the desire of a population for predictability. So with that Civil War, uh, we don't really know how many people were killed. Maybe 150,000, maybe 45,000, um, missing, disappeared, um, maybe 18,000. There was never a truth and reconciliation assessment process afterwards. I'm not talking about everybody holding hands, but just an accounting of who was taken, who was arrested, who was killed. Civil War, what was the date for that day? I've got it up there, don't I? It starts about 1991, and it runs down about 2002, okay? Who um, against It's Islamist forces versus the government, okay? And I say forces, plural, because there's multiple parties on the field. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. Yes and no. I mean, they're not Islamists. They don't look to Islamic law to, um, to govern the country, but they tend to be socially extremely conservative, okay? Uh, the comparison has often been made by people who don't understand to Turkey, in which the military in Turkey has this Republican tradition of secularism. The Algerian military, no, okay, no. So um, one of the so in addition to not knowing who killed whom, um, there are multiple Islamist forces on the field. There were ones closer to the political parties involved in the elections. There were some come back from Afghanistan who were called the Afghans. Uh, they were CIA trained. Um, remember from when the Soviet Union invaded? Yeah. Um, Saudi financed and truly terrible in their civilian attacks. There was also, unfortunately, it looks like military involvement, impersonating Islamists in massacres and roadblocks, many assassinations, journalists, policemen, liberal Islamists involved in the political process. Many Algerians left the country and uh, it's a kind of lost decade. So with so imagine 10 years of, of civil war, unemployment of young people 40%. Coming up with Bouteflika as a figure from the past to be ruling the country sounds reasonable because what the country wanted was stability. In 
In 2008, we get this large economic crisis, right? So Europeans are buying less energy and spending less. They're investing less. They, European countries that export to India and export to Algeria, that uh, export food and uh, various kinds of food goods to Algeria, which is not at all independent for food. Um, they also spend a lot of money in terms of lobbying. So that's a lot of jobs for facilitators, people who connect vendors to the Algerian government, people who help European exporters make the right connections to the European, to the Algerian government to import their things. But all these, these, these expenditures went down in 2008, producing not the same sort of thing as a depression such as we suffered in the United States and Europe, but a bump, right, a, a, a mini recession. So with this petrostate, it's almost like there's two economies. There's the economy associated with the oil and gas exports, um, but then also the economy that people live with. So that's an awful lot of informal economy or black market, because even with economic liberalizations, you might not be able to buy insulin when you need it. Sometimes it might be subsidized. Other times it won't be on the market. So informal markets or um, parallel economies have always been important, an important part of this. Um, the government tariffs goods pretty heavily. Um, for firms that rely on certain kinds of imports to make things or um, for things that are produced in Algeria, there's inspection, currency controls, and a, a lot of pressure on private economic actors. So why would a country do this? Why would a government do this if it wants to liberalize? Why would it be putting pressure on private sector actors? You know what meringues are, these little puffs, you know, made with egg white? They're really popular for Algerian weddings, so you'll get lots and lots of them. Um, and what's in them is egg whites, but you also use cream of tartar. So if you're making egg whites for weddings, you need to get cream of tartar. So um, I heard from a baker how he, his business was just tied up and tied up for months because he couldn't get the cream of tartar powder out of the harbor. Um, so they sent a family member to France to come back and bring it, right? And you just hope you don't get stopped with a large quantity of white powder, what's that gonna look like, right? You know, the dogs are gonna be sniffing it. Um, so just these kinds of, of um, there's just red tapes, one word for it, excess bureaucracy, it just proliferates. There's an awful lot of embroidery in um, domestic production of clothing. So, um, well, Algeria doesn't, you know, imports lots of clothes, when it comes to Folklore and weddings, people do kind of local things, including very, very fancy things. Hard to get embroidery floss and the gold and silver wrap thread. I mean, come on, guys. You know, it's not going to mess up the economy to be importing this. Do you want women to have to import more clothes? So this just kind of vexatious pressure on um, businesses large and small. At one point, bankers were supposed to inspect imports to make sure that they've authorized hard currency for something, and now they need to authorize to just make it sure that it really is. And I heard from um, bankers that I knew that I was interviewing, and they were saying, I don't want to go to the port. They can show me anything. It won't make any sense to me. And so where to put this in your head when you're trying to call this something? This is a, this is a case of... Um, proliferating regulations as a very cumbersome state tries to deregulate, and every deregulation then tends to produce more regulation. And when oil prices go up and down, um, when, the, when the energy prices are down, the state's very anxious about hard currency because it's not getting as much in. So that also produces more uneven policies. I think of it as fretful regulation. Um, it's indifferent to incentives um, 
or you could say it produces perverse incentives. One of the things that always amused me was the vision that policymakers have of a modern economy that they thought they were going to produce. That's boring. Let's look at something more interesting. You've seen that enough. There we go. That's fun. Um, what's the vision of a modern economy that policymakers have? They imagine something that you might find on French corporate web pages. Everything is blue and glass and stainless steel. Everything is offices. Everything is smooth. So the United States, with a robust capitalist economy that has its ups and downs, we know that part of that is construction firms that can't make payroll because there's been a blip in the economy. And so um, the construction company owner's wife will pawn her jewelry. This is 2008. I read about this in New Jersey. Um, in order to make payroll, then she'll get that jewelry back. That's surprising, but it's not unheard of, right? Startup companies in which people are barely scraping along and they're doing everything with their new company from cleaning the floors to um, trying to make the security system work to getting their product going. We know that that's part of capitalism, right? It's part of new companies. Um, it's not a serene, harmonious music of the spheres in which MBAs sit in front of computers all day, right? There's a lot of hustle. It's messy. There's a lot of scrabble, okay? So, the, uh, um, so policymakers in Algeria don't seem to have a very useful idea of thinking about um, a very useful idea of thinking about the economy. So, the civil war that was so important that was a decade, a lost decade, it comes when we have an opening from the top. So. Not long after Algeria got independence in 19, 1962, a few years later, we have a military coup from one of the insiders. And we have a military regime set, put in place. And we saw these all over the Middle East. We saw them all over the developing world. They, they, got, they went from wearing uniforms to wearing suits, but the army was backing them. And the original focus of this was a command economy that wanted to develop very quickly. But by the late 1980s, so oil prices were what in the 1980s? Does anybody remember? They went really high in the 70s, and then in the 1980s, they go way down, right? We get the Petroshock, we get OPEC, everybody starts turning lights off, people start buying Toyotas, um, more oil is brought on stream, like North, Shore, North Sea oil in Britain and the prices go way down. So for countries like Algeria, it's a reverse oil shock, okay? So even though we still have rulers coming out of the army wearing their suits, by the time we get to 1988, 89, 87, they recognize that this is not working. They start cutting public expenditure. They start spending less on their internal industrialization plans and they decide they need to liberalize, to open up the economy and have more private enterprise. But they're not quite sure how to do that. And they want to get public support for this. In 1988, um, they really cut spending on food subsidies and they want demonstrations against public owned firms as being inefficient. So um, high school students are bused to the city, and young men are invited to break the glass of government-owned stores and shops to, so, to show they're angry at the government-focused economy. Well, asking young men to start breaking windows to show that they're angry at government-owned shops is hard to stop. It started days and days of rioting, okay, 1988. And they couldn't stop it. The authorities couldn't stop it. Um, a couple independent preachers were brought to calm the crowds, and it worked. And we'd been seeing the development of an Islamic current in Algeria 
that advocated more attention to Islamic virtues. It was hostile to the socialist command economy, more supportive of private enterprise, and hostile to the isolation of the regime. So it resonated with the concerns of a lot of people. Okay. Um, the Islamic movement wasn't the only movement to criticize the government. You probably know that Algeria has a Berber population. You could say perhaps it's originally a Berber country. So this is actually a map of oil stuff, but see how it's green at the top? More, um, those are mountains up there too. Um, that's an area where there's a lot of Berbers. 90% of the population of this country lives up there on the coast. A lot of this is desert. We're going to go there right now. So um, the name comes from um, the Roman. They were barbarian, right? Um, they, did, they, weren't, they didn't speak Latin. Um, and Berbers themselves are plural. So along the coastal areas are the people that are called the Kabil. And that name came from the Arabs because it's um, a version of tribes, Kabail. So they were Berber groups. They didn't call themselves Kabil. They didn't call themselves Berbers. They would identify themselves by um, kinship group. You know, they don't have a name for all of them. So they were tribally organized groups uh, along the coast and in the mountains. And the dominant group are the people that call themselves, that were called the most, Kabil. So, how different are they from Arabs? Well, they pretty much look alike, and um, they've been Islamicized for centuries. They speak a language that's... A, Arabic and Hebrew have three root as part of their... three roots as part... as forming the basis of their language. Um, the Berber languages are two roots. So they're ancient languages from this region with some relationship to Arabic and Hebrew. So they're very old languages. Um, because not, they were seldom part of complex political organizations in antiquity, there aren't words for things like school or religion. Those terms came in from Arabic and then also for French, from French. So you have the Kabyle along the coast, and because they were along the coast, they were the first to interact with anybody from the outsiders from the outside, so whether connecting to pirates, connecting to the Turkic Ottoman Empire along the, that um, was powerful in, in the, along the Mediterranean for several centuries, um, connecting to Europeans. They're the first to learn new languages and are important in Algeria in education and in government. So when you read that Berbers are oppressed in Algeria, um, it's hard to make sense of it, except that Berber only recently became one of the official languages. Okay. So when Berbers who were educated wrote Berber languages in the past, they would use an Arabic script. Only some places do you see um, the use of a very old script. So if the Kabyle are along the coast, on the east in the mountains are the Shawi, uh, more socially conservative than today's Kabyle and don't really understand the, um, the Kabyle language. There, um, everybody has seen the Tuareg on uh, pictures of them um, with their turbans and their camels in the interior. They're another group related, another Berber group with a language related to the Kabyle and Shawi. And then finally, there are the Mzab, M-Z-A-B. So they live in some isolated oasis in Algeria, and they have a, um, their, um, they have a type of Islam that, it, that isn't shared by anyone else. I think it's a fragment of Shiism, uh, Ibadi Shiism. Um, I don't know when they got it, the 12th century. So they're closed enclaves. Some of their cities are world heritage sites because they're interesting mud cities. So it's not as though they've been sitting in those mud cities since the 12th century. 
Mzab are very much involved in long distance trading networks. Um, all the grocers that you're likely to meet in Algiers with little tiny grocery shops or butcher shops are Mzab. So they have this shopkeeping tradition. Um, not easy to run in a state that's trying to do a command economy, but you know, people have to get groceries. And the Mzab run grocery stores, or have in the past. So in past centuries and decades, religious scholars from Berber clans and groups were important in Algeria's Islamic scene. It's not as though the Muslims are Arabs and the Berbers are pagan. Um, the, the Berbers own Islam. It's part of what they are today. But a fragment of the Berber population or the Kabil population sees itself as more secular, as more connected to the West, and is more interested in a Western secular view of itself. Okay? So that population looks dominant when you're in a big city until you have an open election and everybody votes Islamist. Now, the Berber parties would say, yes, but we boycotted those elections. Elections are complicated that way. I mean, how can you assess what the population thinks until you actually vote, right? Um, until the numbers are counted. But um, it's certainly important to think about more secularist Berber parties, but also a Berberist vision that's not separated from Islam at all. So in the interior, there are some cities uh, with names like Gardaya. Um, used to be popular with kind of hippie types because it was way in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's very traditional. All the men wear little white hats and white onesies. And they see themselves as Muslim. Um, they might vote with the Islamists. They might not. right? So it's a slightly more complex story. Now, one of these images of demonstrations. So today, today's Berbers don't usually, people who are interested in advancing that identity don't see themselves as Berbers. They would use, they would use the, uh, a term Amazir, which means free people. And it's a very old term in Kabil. And it points to the um, existence of slaves and, and hierarchies. Okay? So they've taken something from the past, you know, we're free people as opposed to the people we control, and used it as a name for themselves as a people. OK, does that help with the Berbers? Yeah. Um, most of the people I know from, um, from Algiers are Kabil. It's a Kabil majority city. And this includes people that are in the Islamist movement and people who are not. So we get to the end of the 80s, and there's been some economic liberalization, some, uh, some greater space for freedom of expression, and a Berber poetry uh, conference is going to be held in one of the Berber majority areas at a university. Um, so it's Tizi Uzu, big, I lost my map, um, not far from the coast, um, Kabil area. So it's an obvious place to have a Berber poetry conference. And in the last minute, um, the military government cancels it. There will be no Berber poetry conference. So they expected that this would irritate you know, the people at, at the university, a bunch of overpaid intellectuals. And instead, they get marches and strikes of factory workers and, and farmers that just shut things down. Um, so it's not as though that group was interested in seeing the expansion of Berber studies at the University of TZU Zoo and had their heart set on a Berber poetry conference. Uh, they saw it as a dismissal of their cultural values, right? They should be able to turn on the TV and have and see Berber languages being spoken. They should have local news, right? 
I mean, a lot of people who didn't speak Arabic um, very well in Algeria learned from watching the sportscasters. Um, there's something funny about um, classical Arabic being used in um, following a soccer game, and he kicked it, and he kicked it again, you know? It's, it's, it's very funny. But um, why can't you hear that in Berber, right? You know, daily life. So more pressure to um, include a Berber cultural scape as part of the official vision of Algeria. Um, they were Arab, but they had Berbers with them. It's not as though they're, it's an all Arab group. There are some in, at the top who are Berber. But they're often very dismissive of Berber cultural things. Or they say, fine, you can speak Kabil with your granny, but you know, we only had a novel written in Berber by some French educated idiot in 1992. That's our first Arabic novel, our first Berber novel. How are we going to use, how is this going to be a language in the schools? What's the, what are the demographics of Impossible to say because nobody publishes that, right? Certainly, Algiers is a, in a, the capital is probably a Berber majority city. <laughs> But of those Berbers, many of them are in the Islamic movement. Okay. I mean, you could argue that a language that has loan words for school is not promising to turn into a modern language. You know, spoken languages have to be modernized to be useful. And using what script will you assign to a language that hasn't had its own script for centuries? Okay. But there's one thing that seems to be true: putting pressure on. Uh, people against the expansion of public expression gets you to a bad place, right? Gets you into a new place. Question? The language of face to face communication, even among elites, is spoken Arabic. Okay? Spoken Arabic. And Arabic is a language that you, sounds like you know this, is multiglossic, so face-to-face -face language um, are these dialects. And the status of the dialects has always been iffy out of town. So what we speak amongst ourselves, you know, people in New York would say, oh, that sounds like that tacky Philadelphian. I guess we're not in Philadelphia anymore. Um, so regional dialects are old, they're very old, and they have a lot of, of ancient things in them. But when Algerians came to choose and think about official language, they were very much burdened by um, a collapse of traditional education under French colonialism. So uh, French colonialism produced hardly enough schools. Only one in four Algerian children had access to a school. Um, and the French did not need that many educated Algerians to run the place. So, only one in four has access to a school. There's not much in the way of Arabic education. You end up with a population that knows itself to be undereducated. That's a very hard burden. Does that make sense? Yeah, People that's under the French. Yes. But what about now? It's a hard burden to shake <laughs> because Algerians feel themselves to be undereducated in Arabic and French. When they were trying to Arabize, um, they would get Arabic teachers from Egypt who would turn up their noses at everybody's North African pronunciation and say, I don't understand this ridiculous pronunciation you have. So it continued people feeling bad. What about children's access to school? Today, it's compulsory, and the younger generation is completely literate. And the younger generation can understand French even if they don't speak it as well as the best educated French speakers of the previous generation. Everybody understands it just fine. They watch French television. They might not feel very comfortable about some, acts, some aspects of passé sample, but they understand it fine and are fluent speakers of regular French, most of them, okay? But there is this burden that they don't, that they have of not feeling that they have the best Arabic. Okay, there's a little awkwardness there that remains. So who would not speak Arabic? Um, 
older people in Berber areas, okay? Older people in Berber areas. No, maybe not. Mm -hmm. My landlady, I, I rented a room from, she was the same age as me, and she explained to me that she wasn't, she did, wasn't put to school because of, the, um, because of the War of Independence, and she couldn't write um, in French or Arabic, um, but she could speak French, and she spoke Berber, and she spoke Algerian Arabic, but she was illiterate, completely illiterate, and that's very common. The country is about 99.9% .9 Sunni. There's just a few strange little Shia fragments here and there that come from the Middle Ages. Um, and the Sunnis are more identified with Saudi Arabia than? No, um, no. So um, you probably know that there's four big schools of Islamic law. What you have in most, <laughs> those are big sect, sect differences. But within Sunnism, there's, uh, there's four big systems of law that are historical, and the ones in North Africa are Maliki. And um, this has been explained to me as it's, um, it's very flexible on, uh, it's, it has its conservative aspects and its flexible aspects. Um, but it's not what the Saudis, the Saudis have. And um, what else can I say about North African Islam? Um, historically, it's produced some of the, some very rigorous movements uh, from tribal groups giving rulers a hard time about corruption. Okay, so um, the tent, uh, it's a, sometimes I hear Algerians say, you know, this, the, all this, this radicalism, it comes from Saudi Arabia. And I'll say, you know, but look at so-and-so, and look at so-and-so, and look at so-and-so. These are all Algerian Islamists from earlier time periods that were attacking corruption. So they've been working on corruption for a long time. Um, corruption of courts, it's historical. What Saudi Arabia brought was money that was important in the anti-Soviet struggles, and then some of those men who had volunteered to fight against the Soviet Union come back. And they have a Saudi vision of, uh, of Islam, which is sharper in terms of, of who's in and who's out. Um, and a radic even a radicalized version of that. So these guys are called the Afghans, but they're seen as importing something from Saudi Arabia. Um, we'll come up to these guys soon. However, with independence, um, the Algerian government has control of all the mosques and the money used to support them. So the French had controlled the mosques during the French colonial period. When Algeria is independent, the government controls the mosques. So um, the sermon is printed in Algiers and faxed out to everybody you know, once a week. So the government has its line in all the mosques. And the government takes control of new mosques when they're finished. You see a loophole? So if we want to have an independent mosque that is not run by a flunky from Algiers, we'll just not quite finish it, okay? It's made out of cinder block. And so that means that um, you, who studied at an Islamic university and are not being paid by the government, you're gonna preach because we trust you. So we get these, this expansion of independent preachers, and they're criticizing the government. They're not big on socialism. Uh, and they're not big on centralization of power, and they're not big on pressure against small business people. Um, so you can see I'm not really hostile to this point of view. They're also extremely socially conservative. Not so keen on that. Is the, would the economy of the country be described as socialist? It certainly sees itself that way. But Algerian scholars have called it state capitalist, in which the state decides what it's going to invest in. Okay? After the War of Independence, peasants did occupy French farms and say, we're going to run these now. And the government came in and ran them um, in a very kind of like Soviet collectivization. You're going to be collectivized, but we're going to tell you how to do it. And the, um, the results of that are very poor 
You never have the seed the day you need the fertilizer. You never get the tractor. It always comes on different days. And Algeria has not been um, self-sufficient for food since. Okay. Was it uh, at one point, it was the uh, bread basket of North Africa. Uh, it, it exported a lot of grain to Rome um, and to France. Okay, so we have Berber activism, we have independent Islamic movement starting. At the same time, the government is trying to have a, a, an opening. And we know this from, it's so nice talking to people who can remember the 70s. Um, you know, Portugal was in, got rid of its military ruler, Salazar died, and Portugal got a democracy. Then Spain, and then Greece, and then countries in South America, in Latin America, start having democratization movements. Some of those get rolled back right away, but we studied them and studied them, and they were big surprises. Scholars did not think that Portugal and Spain and Greece were going to, boom, produce democracies, much less Brazil, Argentina, Chile. There were all these cultural reasons given why Southern Europe and Latin America were never going to produce democracies, until they did. And we had to come up with new theories. But one of the things we learned is that when governments make openings, sometimes they make openings because they lost a war, like in Argentina, it was very embarrassing. Um, Greece tried to challenge Turkey over Cyprus and lost a war, and the military junta was so embarrassed they stepped down. But when there's an opening, sometimes their government is seeking more support, like in Algeria, to have different economic policies. So they say, all right, we're going to have some public criticism, and we're going to have some public expression. And the next thing they know, they have 20 opposition newspapers, 50 opposition parties, and 5 million people in the streets. Um, these kinds of openings get out of hand very quickly. All kinds of groups that haven't been part of them dash into them. In Latin America, it was indigenous people's groups, feminists. In Algeria, it's been different Islamist groups. It's been feminists. It's been Berber groups, everything from Berbers who say we want an autonomous state to one of the most important one, FFS, Front de Force Socialiste. So it sees itself as socialist, and they're all Berber, um, and see themselves as very secular. So multiple parties, some parties from the past with old figures and then new figures. So they got this tumultuous opening, and it was fascinating. It's when I started my study of Algeria, because they were doing a political opening and an economic opening at the same time late 80s, early 90s. It was crazy. So uh, a government minister would go on state TV to talk to some um, journalists, and he'd think this would be a real de decorous kind of event with hand-picked journalists from state television and the, and the state newspaper, maybe a few independents. And they open up their files, and they have figured out how much debt Algeria is carrying by piecing together you know, stuff from France, stuff from somebody who worked at the IMF, you know. And they're confronting government ministers with tough questions. Apparently, people in Morocco and Tunisia watched this because, oh my God, look what's going on in Algeria. It was wild. It really taught me that if you have a closed political system and then you open it up, you don't have to wait for people to learn how to do an opposition party. They do have to learn how to negotiate, because they haven't been able to do that. It's not matter. They just take positions and are idealistic and hang on to them. And I'm like, no, there's this old American expression that sausage and laws are made in a disgusting way. You don't want to watch. Sausage is good. Laws are good. But you don't want to watch either of them being made. You know, dealing, compromise. You know, it's not always an attractive process, negotiating. You have to give things up. So Algerians don't know how to negotiate, but people do know how to, to create opposition parties. And journalists, journalists that have had to keep their heads down and have been censored for years, it's just like they turn on their computers or open up their little notebook, and they're different people. Um, people make that change pretty quickly. Now, you could also say, as some editors do, there's a lot of overstepping at first. You know, with, 
people figure out just because you can say anything, should you, right? Um, but it's also not like Algeria has been in a box. Even if the government is closed that way, people work in France. People watch French TV. And those of you who are Francophone, um, there's a long tradition of political sarcasm or um, you know, journals and that are very sarcastic. Um, what are they, the, the, um, the canard enchaîné, some duck in it that is, it's like the onion, only it's national, right? You all know the onion, right? So imagine the onion, you know, but bigger, right? Based in Washington. So they've been watching this for years, decades, their whole career. So kaboom. And the government says, fine, we're going to have open elections. Well, the old ruling party is trying to get going again. And what wins is a group that no one thought would win, uh, a coalition of Islamic forces called the um, Islamic Salvation Front. And it is a coalition. It is not a, it is not one thing. So um, different subgroups, um, some more international, and it had this interesting dual leadership. So these two men, um, the guy in blue was a university professor, um, and his trajectory is really striking. Uh, he was involved in the revolution, or the war against France. He was arrested right away after he bombed a radio station or a TV station, sent to prison in France, and he showed them what he was made of by learning English. So learning English when you're in French prison is a real go-to-hell position um, because learning French, French is a pathway to civilization. English gives you access to the world of the West and science, but nobody who speaks English <coughs> thinks it's going to make you into a better human being. You know, it's a language that's, there are great things to read in English, right? But we don't think that you're going to become a more civilized person, do we? But Francophonie and the commitment to French is very strong as a civilizational trajectory. So learning it in um, prison was a big deal. He did some studies in England. He teaches philosophy, you're used to, at University of Algiers. And at the end of a semester, due to his calm, manner, all the boys would start to grow beards, all the young women would wear headscarves. The other guy was a preacher who was um, considered to have not be able to tell a lie or compromise, and he has an unusual appearance. People said his father was a French officer and his mother was a Vietnamese concubine brought by the French officer. Oh, come on, no. But it's just a myth, okay, that connects him to something wrong, but also something Algerian, something exotic. Um, what is he really? <coughs> Algerian from the interior, a little darker, sharper features. Um, this all meant, all these slides made sense as I was organizing them. So, First, they win local elections, and they don't do a bad job with local elections. Um, they delivered on their uh, corruption, anti-corruption thing. If you were a, a baker, you could get access to flour as opposed to being told it's gone all the time. Um, they built little concrete areas with water so farmers could bring their produce in from the country and market it directly to people instead of having to go through state agricultural boards. Um, if there wasn't a place for kids to play soccer, they would talk to a private contractor and say, you know, can you help us out here and produce a little crummy soccer field? Um, they, they got things going as opposed to the traditional way of doing things in Algeria is if we want a soccer field, we'll talk to the, um, we'll try to submit a proposal to the Minister of Recreation and Youth. Right? We go through proper channels, as opposed to who do we know who's got an earth mover that will help us out? What year did they win the election? I think the nine, um, late 80s, early 90s. Um, 
but they keep pushing to have a national election to move the presidential elections up. Um, the Algerian government brings in uh, election specialists from France to um, gerrymander the elections and draw new districts. And uh, in December, and they make some arrests. And in December, it looks like they're going to win everything. Uh, at which point, the military creates a coup. And it's a coup against the Islamists, but also against parts of the regime that were going to work with the Islamists. And this meant um, a lot of military guys that came out of the military, but were more oriented towards a liberal economy. Uh, a lot of economists were in trouble because they had advocated an op a more open economy and were now having to keep their heads down. So the country goes into civil war and uh, things are being blown up. Uh, the army is running around the countryside. There's urban terrorism. We have a, um, an army associated with this organization. Um, Arme Islamique de Salou, and then we also get these guys of um, called the um, Armed Islamic Group of um, returned Afghans, and we ha so we have more than one Islamic force. And not too long into it, the military associated with these guys does a unilateral ceasefire because they said there's too much killing going on, and nobody can tell who's getting killed, and it's really a dirty civil war of the worst sort. Okay, where are my scary slides? Okay. So a lot of um, unknown operations, a lot of torture, a lot of commando operations, false flags, um, a lot of disappeared people, okay, um, mostly men. So a truly horrible war. Very little international intervention. It just kind of ran its own course. Um, so, in the United States, 9-11 happens in the course of this war, and the Algerian military does very well out of 9-11 in that it can say, we have terrorists too, we need more weapons. So, it, at one point, the uh, military strategy is called eradicateur, to eradicate them all, but that's not working, so they move to some kind of amnesty and are able to get fighters to stop fighting and to wind it down, okay, wind it down. Um, it breaks down into um, more like armed entrepreneur warlords in urban areas. Um, they finally were able to wind it down. So this trauma is the reason I think you don't see Algerians uh, with the Arab uprisings or the Arab Spring. One Algerian political scientist said there's absolutely no trust between more Islamic-oriented people and secularists because the secularists were happy to have the military come in. So that makes political trust impossible. But that's behind us now, right? That's behind us. Um, we end up with some amnesty. We end up with better economic um, situation because of rising prices. And I'm going to wind up. How are we doing for time? We should be winding up now. So with that extra money, we don't necessarily get good spending. Um, so you're young people. So um, yes, start laughing at me. How many of you have listened to any music from North Africa called Rai? No? Okay. It's R-A-I. Um, Sheb Khalid is the most famous. You're young. You should know this stuff if you like world music at all. So if you Google Rai or and Sheb Khalid, um, it's really great stuff. Um, so one of these musicians, and it, it came from the places that a lot of great music comes from, dangerous bars. In, in a western city in Algeria. Um, they call this government a Mickey Mouse government. So um, I think it's 2016 that we get a terrorist attack on um, a British BP and Algerian joint 
oil and gas operation, and a bunch of the British uh, oil workers are killed. And in the investigation after it, it you just can't believe how, how crappy the security was. It just, just worthless, you know. Um, your average apartment building in a city has five times the security. They were running in a place um, 50 miles from the Libyan border when Libya is in a civil war. You know, just, just Mickey Mouse government. So we get a lot of new money coming in with this new stuff. We get a lot of stupid spending. Um, the president has had a stroke. Um, he's the ideal president now for a military government in that he can't talk. Um, he's in a wheelchair all the time. He makes no public appearances. He's the perfect figurehead. And, um, He's going to run again and again past term limits, constitutional amendment to give him term limits. And you see um, people deciding this just has to stop. You know, they just can't wheel him out, unable to speak, and then wheel him back. So enormous stuff starts against a fifth term, and it just keeps going from there. So even though we get all this money coming in, uh, it gets spent on things like uh, this for the military elite um, in the older neighborhoods um, where they've been declared World Heritage Sites. You have German and Scandinavian foundations doing historic reconstruction, but not the Algerian government. And these wonderful old French colonial buildings uh, that many people live in have infrastructure issues. They weren't made to have air conditioners dripping water on them, you know, on the plaster walls. Um, they need serious renovation. And all the money is going to things like bringing giant palm trees from Spain to plant in military housing for officers. Or better yet, uh, housing for military villas that are built around to include Roman ruins. So people who were going to go see Roman ruins they saw 30 years ago, they can't find them. So they finally talk to somebody in the town, and they go, ha, ha, it's inside that villa. Can you believe that? So um, I don't know. You can't, is that corruption? You just need a better word for it. It's not corruption. It's just um, privatization of public assets by elites. No. Tourists just clutter up the beaches, wear shorts, look disgraceful. So this is why we get these demonstrations week after week after week. And the regime has started to arrest people. So this businessman has been charged with, um, obviously, some kind of fraud. He worked in France for many years. He's, um, he's a billionaire. He doesn't need to be doing fraud. He has a big, massive, legitimate business. He, probably employs about, a, I don't know, if you're a billionaire, how many accountants do you need? Um, there's not likely to be fraud involved here. Um, this man was involved with one of the Berber secularist parties and then developed another party that's secular. He's been arrested. This guy is an up-and-comer young Berber um, political figure. He's been arrested. This guy used to be um, involved in a he was a state television. Um, he uh, quit and became an independent journalist and does his, makes YouTube videos. He's been arrested. Um, they also arrested this woman so they could say they were arresting Arabs as well as Berber. She's head of a uh, Trotskyite Communist Party called um, Party of um, PT Algerian Workers Party. She's considered a grand old lady who maybe doesn't have a lot of common sense, but she has integrity. Um, so um, she's respected, she's harmless, um, she's out there, you know, raving the red flag. She doesn't need to be arrested, she's, nobody listens to her. Um, they're not going to have a communist revolution in Algeria, um, but they arrested her. So I referred to those riots in 1988. Uh, I like that toothless, well he's not toothless, he's got some teeth. Uh, I like that older guy out there, um, these guys with, um, these traditional white hats. Um, this shows us it's not just young moderns that are out there, not just children of the upper middle class who are demonstrating on behalf of accountable government. 
This guy's been nominated by the Liberal Islamist Party. Um, his background is, is absolutely um, characteristic. He has a, a business degree as well as uh, an Islamic studies degree. It's absolutely, to have that business degree is what I would expect him to have acquired. Um, so what's happening now is people like him are involved in negotiations with the military government to try to get some kind of opening or step down. The crowd, though, does not want any negotiations. They want the military to leave. But that's not how militaries exit politics. They have to be negotiated out. So the political science term for this is pacted transition. You get a pact. They get to keep the villa. They get to keep their Swiss bank accounts because they have the tanks. Now, we know how this works. 20 years later, you can go after those tanks, you can go after the villa and the bank account. But, um, or somebody might try to get a war crimes trial. I'm against those things because you need to get them to step down, and they won't if they say, look what happened in Argentina. First they had a deal, and then when they went after them. So if you want the, if you want the guys to leave politics with the tanks, you have to cut deals. And right now the crowd is not interested in negotiating. And it just goes on and on. So we have elections. So that's, yeah. See, it's a very sophisticated population. Well educated, very aware. Okay. So, um, no you can't, right? Um, so I'm moderately pessimistic because getting military leaders to step out of politics is very, very hard to do. Um, when they said early in April, they said Buda Flekel will step down, and then they thought they were going to encourage everyone to support them by prosecuting some of his family members, like, look, we're going to get rid of Buda Flika and go after his friends. People didn't say, oh, I'm so glad. They just said, and now we want you to step down too. So it's very hard getting military out of, pop, out of politics. Turkey has been able to do it, but it's been a rough thing. It took about 50 years. Nobody's happy with Erdogan, but at least the military is out of politics right now. Um, it's very hard to get it to happen. And that's where we are. Okay, I'm finished. And you're all, now you don't clap. <laughs> <laughs>